Well, good afternoon, and welcome to worship. We're so glad that you're here, and for those of you joining us online, also a very special welcome. We are in this season of Lent, and as we continue on with our series in Colossians, I want to make sure you're aware of our Lenten project in which we are helping support a, a mission start down in Wellington Heights in downtown Cedar Rapids. And if you would like to be a part of that, we have a $25,000 matching grant, and we've raised just shy of $15,000. If you would like to be part of that, uh, you can make out a check, and make sure you put Lenten Project on the memo line. And, uh, and if you'd like to do it, go online, you can go to our website and do that. We also have our Colossians, pardon me, our Colossians study guides which are available online and, of course, out here. If you're around on a Sunday morning and like to pick one up or during the week, we'd love to have you participate in that. But now I'd invite you to stand as we join together in our confession. And before we do that, I do want to, oops, I do want to thank, I do want to thank Chris Lindell and Kelly Frampton and our tech team for just making this, this time possible for us. All right, we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In 1 John chapter 1, we hear these words. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. I invite you now to begin our time together in confession with a few moments of silence and then we'll confess together. We confess our sins today using the words of Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me from my guilt, purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. The Lord God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. It is in our Lord Jesus Christ that we have redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. He has taken upon himself the weight of our sins, and so I say on his behalf, the Lord Jesus Christ, that your sins are forgiven. You have been rescued by him. The price has been paid on the cross by him, the author and giver of of life. Amen. We join together now in our hymn, How Firm a Foundation.
be seated. Our reading today is from Colossians chapter 2, and I'll be focusing in on verses 1 to 10, and then the second half of verse 13 through 15. And if you have your guides, you can certainly follow along. This is what St. Paul writes. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your life in him, lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives bodily in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is head over every power and authority. And then jumping to verse 13. He forgave us all our sins having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken away, taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authority, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing them um, over them by the cross. This is the word of God, the word of life. A couple of weeks ago, we heard these words from chapter 1, Uh, in verses 12 and 13. Paul wrote this, God has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Now I want you to imagine, because we're talking about inheritance here, but I'd like you to think of you know, maybe the most um, crazy, wonderful thing that you had some great aunt that you never knew about. And she had 20, lake, 20 acres on, uh, let's say, Clear Lake, or if Lake Tahoe's your thing, 20 acres with a beautiful lake house there. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's somewhere up in the mountains in Colorado. Take your pick. It could be on the beach wherever you like. But all of a sudden, you got word, you got a letter from an attorney saying, It's yours. Taxes are paid. All the rest. There you go. How would you feel? I know I'd feel pretty good. I'd also wonder, is there a catch? Is there some sort of expectation? Is is there something I need to do? And what you begin to realize is, well, I, I, I guess I just need to go and enjoy it and invite my friends. And I, my guess is I'd probably have new friends because of this when they found out of what I had just gotten. And here, here's one step up. Imagine that you had been imprisoned up until the point of finding about, out this inheritance. And you had been imprisoned and had been kind of rotting in jail And that somehow, as part of this inheritance, also came a commutation of your sentence. And and the way that it came was that there had been a debt that you couldn't pay. Now, it's hard for us to imagine being in prison for a debt, but in most of the rest of the world, through most of the rest of history, if you had a debt you couldn't pay, you went to debtor's prison. But imagine that that great aunt also paid the debt and got you set free, and then you got to go live at Tahoe or at Clear Lake or Okoboji, wherever it is. 
Imagine that. And as we think about this, I want you to, to imagine the inheritance that you have from God for a moment. Because the, the, the fact is God has given you far more than what you were just thinking through and imagining. Because frankly, the inheritance that you and I have in Jesus Christ isn't a property that's gonna wear out. You know, the, the beams are gonna rot eventually. The dock is gonna rust. You're gonna have to fix it. There are no taxes because, yeah, there was tax free to get it, but guess what? <laughs> You're going to have to pay. But our inheritance in Jesus Christ, He pays it all. It's just a gift of grace. And it's not only for all eternity, it starts right now. Paul says, He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. And back to the verses for today. And the special verses that are up here, uh, verses six and seven, and our theme word is, as you can see, rooted. So let me read these verses to you. I'm gonna add a little bit. And, And one of the things that you're gonna have to get used to when Paul writes, when he uses the word you, it is almost always you plural. And so all of you, now I know we say you guys around here, right? But you gotta get a little Southern here, a little Texan, and and you're gonna have to say y'all, okay? Because when Paul talks about this, he's talking about, I mean, when I say y'all, does it include you also? Absolutely. But it also has this sense of community. It has a sense of all of the people together. And so when Paul says this, beginning at verse six, so then just as you, y'all, received Christ as Lord, continue to live your, and that is y'all's, life, lives in him. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you, Y'all were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. And so as we look at this, now keep, keep in mind as I talk about each one of these words that Paul is talking about as you continue to live your life in him. This is an ongoing action. We are called to continue to live and to live and to live. Right starting now, as you are in Christ, you continue to live out your life. And so we, let's get to that word rooted. Paul uses a phrase, having been firmly rooted. And now it's a little Greek term, but it, it's helpful to know what, what's going on here with Paul's language. He's very deliberate when he chooses these words. It's in what's called the perfect passive tense. And we'll, we'll focus in on the, the passive tense. And the passive tense in the Greek always means that we are the ones being acted upon. We receive passively, right? And so, interestingly enough, when, when Paul says being rooted, that word rooted is in that perfect passive tense, which, which means that to be rooted is actually something that's accomplished by God. You know, we talk about, well, you gotta sink down your roots. You gotta do this, you gotta do this so that your roots can get down there. And what Paul is saying is, no, wait a minute. God is the only one that can do that. God is the only one that can make your roots grow. He accomplishes that. And and notice this, remember, it's y'all. That as a community of faith, it's only in Jesus Christ that your roots can continue to grow. That our roots as a congregation can continue to grow and deepen. Now, think about for a moment, what, does, what do roots accomplish? Well, I mean, we know with the derecho, uh, it helps to have a really good root system. The ones that didn't, what happened to those trees? Down they came. What happened to some of the trees that did have great root systems? Some of those down they came, okay? But 
We know for sure that the ones that didn't came down much faster, typically. And so they, they add stability, they add strength to the rest of the structure. They add strength to your, the roots that go down in Jesus Christ, that, that he is growing for you, help you in this life right now. Allow you to grow and become the human being that God has called you to be so that you can have the hope, so that you can have the faith, so that you can have all that you need for this life. God accomplishes that through the roots. What else do the roots do? They feed, they feed the tree, right? I mean, it goes out, it pulls the nutrients out of the soil, it, it does all of this work, Pull, pulls, of course, the water. I was talking to um, one of our Eight Days of Hope guys that was here during the derecho, and he had a tree service uh, out, out east in Ohio. And I was just visiting with him a little bit, and I said, um, don't tell me about what you do. And he, we were talking about it, and he was talking about, you know, some of these trees, when they cut them, especially near the top, uh, actually water starts flowing out of the top. He said, cottonwoods are the worst. He said, you know, we'll, we'll cut off the top of a cottonwood, if it's, especially if it's near a stream, and the water, he said, I will be soaked from water when I cut the top of that tree off because it's just coming up. And he said, if you put, if you put some dye, we, said, we used to do this in our arbor school, you, you would inject some dye next to one of these trees, especially the cottonwoods, and within 15 or 20 seconds, it would be at the top of the tree coming out. That's what being rooted in Christ is. It's not we think of roots being as kind of this slow, passive thing. But no, they are meant to be active for each and every one of us, growing deeper. And you know, for us as Christians, we don't have to say, come on, roots, grow deeper, grow deeper. Because we know that God is the one accomplishing that. Listen to Jeremiah 17. Um, prophets, the prophet says this about these roots and, and what they do. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. And what, what does that accomplish? He continues. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. So when Paul says be, be, that we are rooted in Jesus Christ, it harkens back to that Old Testament passage from Jeremiah 17. But as you heard, being rooted is not being rooted in what, it's root, being rooted in who. In whom are we rooted? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we see, and Paul is continually encouraging this, that we can absolutely trust him. We can have absolute confidence in him. And especially when the drought comes, when the difficult days come, when the heat is burning on us. And it's not just us as individuals, again. It's us as a community of faith, putting down those roots and relying on him. And so the next line, so... Going in, we say, continue to live, Paul says, continue to live your life, lives in him, rooted and built up in him. Being built up in him, I got to go back again to the Greek. It, it, it also is in the passive tense. It's being built. You know, I, many of us, um, and I don't think this is just a man thing, but we love to build. We love to get out there and start doing, creating, making things happen. And we want to fix things. Well, Paul says that it's God doing it. He's not saying, okay, now go out. You got to go out and build yourself up here. He's just, he's saying, God is going to build you up. God is going to sink the roots for you, and he's going to build you up. And you as an individual, but also you as a community of faith, you as a family, you as in your friendships and relationships. 
being built up in him. And he also is clear about, the, and again, the way he uses the language, is that this is a continuing process. This isn't something that you say, ooh, that's all built, I'm done. It is something that goes on and on and on in your life. We're not a finished product. <laughs> we say, oh, okay, I'm a Christian, I'm good, uh, I don't have to go to church anymore, I don't need, I, you know, I don't need to read the Bible because now I'm a Christian, I'm saved. Oh, Paul says, that, no, this is in life, we are built up as a community and as individuals in an ongoing, ongoing, ongoing way. And notice what he says. We're built up in him. In him. Not in our own strength, not on our own hope, not in our own grace, you know, not in, by our own grace, not on, by our own power, but in Christ Jesus our Lord. And of course, Paul isn't finished with us. Uh, he says this, again, I'm going to come back to the little phrase, continue to live out your, your, your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and strengthened in the faith. Okay, as you can see, translate it out right, strengthened. It's a passive tense again. Guess who's acting? Guess who's doing it? Guess who's accomplishing it? It's Jesus Christ. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that is strengthening your life. You know, one of, the, one of the great things that we can do, and it's so scriptural, is we can say, we can say, Lord, sink those roots for me. Build me up. Build up family, build up friends, build up the church. Strengthen my faith, strengthen our faith together. Because it is God creating it. And, in, you know, as we look at this, um, you know, we always want to remember, yes, we are to have a personal faith in Jesus Christ. But every, almost every time we hear faith mentioned in Scripture, it is a y'all. It is our faith together, which, of course, involves you personally having faith in Jesus Christ, but that importance of being together and living together in him. And finally, um, notice this. He says, built up in him, strengthened in faith as you were taught, and it's y'all taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. I don't know about you, but my guess is that um, unless you're really scared about those friends or relatives that are going to come out of the woodwork, if you had gotten released from debtor's prison, all things paid, and had gotten those 20 acres on the lake and this fabulous inheritance, it's really good news. And you might want to let at least your closest friends and family members know about it. And think now what you have in Jesus Christ. And that's where Paul's going with this. You have this inheritance. And Christ has given all of this to you on an ongoing basis. It, you know, all right, I don't want to stretch the, the Lake Tahoe thing too, too long, but the ongoing basis is sort of like, and, you know, and the taxes are paid every single year and the repairs are paid every single year. In Jesus Christ, for you, Christ is paying this every single year. People say, well, why, why do you have to confess your sins if you're already a Christian and they're already forgiven? Guess what? You keep sinning. As long as we are in this flesh, it's like that beautiful house. It needs fixing. As long as it's standing, it's going to need, as long as we are in these bodies, as long as we have these minds, we're going to need forgiveness. We're going to need renewal. We're going to need to have our roots down. And what's amazing is God sinks down the roots and provides all of the nutrition and water and the living water and all the rest that you and I need. And what does he say? He says, do you believe it? Do you believe I have all this for you? Trust me. Paul always comes back and he says, what do you have to do? And, and, the, and he always comes back to this one thing. Trust him. Trust that it's true. 
You could sit back there and say, I'm not leaving prison. No way. There's a big catch here. I don't want to be a part of that. That house, no, I, I'm not moving to California or wherever that is. It's on the Nevada side. No, you know, whatever it is. You know, I'm not going to go all the way up there to that lake up there. Paul just says, you know what? Have faith. Trust that what Jesus has accomplished and what Jesus is going to, because you know what? He has an answer for everything. Well, the taxes are going to be outrageous. It, they're paid. Your sin's paid for. Well, I'm going to have to do this, this, and this in order to earn this. Nope. Trust him. He has provided and will provide for you starting now and for all eternity. That's something to be thankful for. Would you play, pray with me, please? Gracious Lord God, we thank you. Thank you for the gift of life, for the gift of salvation, for the gift of rootedness, for the gift of being built up, not only for us as individuals, but also as a community of faith. Open our hearts and, and take our lives and help us to trust you and help us also as we go forward to live in, in a grateful, thankful way as we serve and tell other people about the inheritance that they have and that they will receive in you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing our hymn, Take My Life That I May Be. please pray with me. Gracious Lord God, you know the troubles in our lives. You know the troubles in our nation and in our world. You know the sorrows that so many face. You know the heartache of the poor, of the sick, of those who have no justice in their lives. Father, we pray for those who are imprisoned without trial, without even accusation or charge in so many places throughout this world. Lord, we pray for the parents who are not able to provide food for their children this day. Lord, we pray for those who suffer unjustly. Father, we pray for children who are in trouble or abused. Lord, we lift up those who are in desperate need, wherever they may be, including in our own nation. We do thank you for the opportunities that we have to love and support one another, but also to reach out across the oceans, across this world, even across our state and community to help those who, who need it. And Father, we pray for our nation and its leaders, and we ask that you would bless them, help them to know and experience the power of your presence, especially as they make important decisions, help them to be in line with your will. And we pray for healing within our nation, healing within our communities. And Father, we also ask 
that you would uh, bless Wellington Heights and all of the people there who are a part of the Wellington Heights community, that they would be able to work and support one another in love. And Father, we pray for your church here at St. Mark's and your church throughout the world, that would be, we would be faithful in our calling to proclaim you as Lord, as Savior, as the one who gives, gives us life and gives us hope and gives us salvation. Lord God, we thank you for your beloved son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, children of God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.